Welcome, everybody, to the Sports Experience Podcast. My name is Dominic DiTola, and I'm sitting here with my co-host, Chris Quinn. And today we got a double dose of some 50th state in the Union sports action. Yeah, this is uh, another Hawaiian podcast. Yeah, and uh, I'd like to take a moment here to uh, recognize uh, one of my good friends. Uh, He was one of my fraternity brothers. He was my drinking sensei and uh, really someone that got me into comedy. Uh, Mr. Brian Sundance Whiter, who suggested the Duke Kahanamoku one. And uh, for this episode, I figured, why not make it a uh, Hawaiian weekend for us? Well, let me just say this. So it's this guy's fault. Yes. The drinking, the comedy, <laughs> all of it. We could draw it all back to this guy. Oh, my God. Hey, he took, he took an 18-year-old kid who just showed up in Honolulu and uh, gave him some self-confidence. And, he took uh, him under his wing, and he was like, Dom, let me show you. Let oh, me, yeah. Let me show you how to polish off this case. <laughs> Fifth club. I won't get into Oof. that, though. But uh, today, um, after we talked about Duke, um, the reason I wanted to do this episode, um, we haven't done a lot of college football on this podcast, but um, this is a very special team, uh, not only to the university, but also to uh, college football and um, the Western Athletic Conference in general. And this is the uh, story of the 1992 uh, Hawaii Rainbow Warriors Holiday Bowl winning team. Yeah, yeah, a great team. Honestly, probably the best in school history. I mean, when I was there, 06, they had a really good team. And then the next year when they got uh, Uncle Slippy Fisted in the Sugar Bowl by Georgia, I mean, that was that was an ass beating. Yeah, well. But uh, the 92 team, they always call them the 92 Miracle because heading into that season, people were picking them to finish eighth or even last in the old Western Athletic Conference. Yeah, which I, I saw that, which was pretty crazy how low they are rated preseason. Yeah, and uh, to take it back a bit, yeah. leading into this, um, Dick Tomey, who we all know in Tucson and love, um, kind of made Hawaii a respectable program, brought him into the Division 1A level in 79, um, upped the ticket sales at Aloha Stadium from like 14, 15K per game to like over 40,000 people in a 50,000 seat stadium. Yeah. He brought respectability, but obviously after uh, Larry Smith screwed the U of A over, they needed a coach. And so Tommy went to Arizona, and that is a huge reason why there are a ton of Polynesian players on U of A's team and has been since he took over. I was going to say, and has been even since he left afterwards. Like, they mm-hmm. they kind of can see that that's a, a pathway for them. Yeah, and he's beloved. Like, when I was working at the uh, sports arena there, um, I was there when they inducted him into their um, Ring of Honor Hall of Fame. And just an absolutely cool guy. Abs- yeah. I don't know if he necessarily wanted to leave, but Arizona was just at the time in the Pac-10, bigger job, you know had other goals the WAC was definitely a a a way lesser of a conference yeah but it you could see you know the look on his face how proud he was and how much he loved coaching there yeah I bet them um his assistant his defensive coordinator Bob Wagner though took over and uh 1987 and by 1989 they make their first bowl game they go to the Aloha Bowl played in their own stadium uh get spanked by Michigan State but that's the first year that they beat their main rival, Brigham Young, and you can tell what a great program it is. Now, I want to get into this because I was ignorant. as Don't uh, even get me started. As to this, I said, who the hell would have a rivalry with BYU? And you said, Hawaii, idiot, missionaries. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. But I never even think about it as to why that would be a rivalry, but it makes... Dude, you go up North Shore, that's where the BYU-Hawaii campus is. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 I just, I never even put it together, but man, it made for some great games with oh, them. Oh, it, it made for some incredible games. Yeah. But after 89, even though they beat BYU in that 1990 game, which we mentioned in our Rocket Ishmael episode... Yep. Um, they finish seven and five. You know, they kind of have an up and down season. And then 91 is when they really kind of hit the shits. Yeah, they did not have a good season. That's why they were so uh, 
shit. That's why their ranking was so low going into '92. Yeah, they were four seven and one, and they lose probably their best offensive player, um, slot back Jeff Seidner. He got drafted by the Eagles. He was a really entertaining guy. I don't think he was more than like five foot six tall, but man, he was quick and could really do some interesting things yeah. uh, on the field. But you lose Seidner, and then you have a heartbreaking loss to end the season against Notre Dame um, in Hawaii. Because Notre Dame at that time, my dad was telling me that um, they would play games against UH specifically so they could recruit players, so they could poach people like Manti Teo and his fake girlfriend and shit down the road. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I mm-hmm. didn't, I mean, it makes sense, but <laughs> because, and I hate to bring it up again, but those missionaries are there. So yeah, they, they are. see, they see religion. And, and if you're not Mormon, but you're still religious. You're like, hey, come on over to Notre Dame, baby. Yeah, oh, God. I'd like to see a fight between the Pope and Joseph Smith. That'd be pretty sweet. Oh, my God. I'd pay for that. Oh, yeah. But uh, sorry. Sorry to get a little off topic. But uh, that game is also important because it sets the stage for one of Hawaii's most exciting quarterbacks in school history because he plays that game with broken ribs and almost leads them to a victory, even though they lose 48-42, to 42, and that's Michael Carter. And I don't know if you watched any of his videos online, but this dude, not the greatest thrower of the football, but he doesn't need to be because of the offense that they run, and he was tough as a junkyard dog, dude. Like, when you watch him on some of these runs, just an absolute gamer beast. But uh, And yeah. that's, that's 91. Yeah, that's 91. In a loss against Notre Dame. And he's a sophomore, so he's heading into the following season, but yeah. they lose their probably their best offensive player in Seidner. You know, Did they have Paul Johnson as their offensive coordinator at this point? They did indeed, because okay. they're running... Uh, Want to talk about him and uh, his uh, assistant there? Well, this is what I wanted to talk about was the formation, because I didn't grow up playing football. Yeah. So when these formations are thrown at me, I don't completely understand it, but I ended up reading a ton about... Um, what is it? The flex bone. The flex bone, yes. And I thought it was so interesting because of the versatility of it. Yeah. The, uh, the flex bone, if you're unaware, it's basically taking a wishbone formation and taking away the tight end along the line or even adding multiple receivers, but taking those two running backs split out, um, behind the fullback and quarterback and using them as slot backs. Yeah. So what it allows your offense to do is you're very run based, but it's a triple option offense, which means the quarterback takes the snap. He can either hand it off to the fullback, you know, if he reads that key correctly. He can either use the trailing slot back behind him as a pitch option as he's going out, or he can just keep it himself. Yeah, it's a very um, feeling. It's a very, like, what's the defense doing? Let's do this. It's a very, like, I bet audible heavy, if well, you will. Well, not even audible no? heavy. Okay. You only have about a set of maybe 10 different plays. Okay. But it's very confusing for the it's defense. It's very confusing okay. because you can do three, four, five different things off of those, and you can audible if you're using multiple wide receivers, like I've seen. And this will come into play definitely for them this season because they don't have a lot of slot backs, but they do have a he- – two very good quarterbacks yes that they can use as slot because your quarterback in this offense he's just an extra running back yeah he needs to be able to run yeah he needs to be able to run and he the offensive line needs to be very disciplined and very um with their shit at all times and the quarterback needs to be very smart because he has to make the appropriate read on every play yeah that's because you're not working with a hell of a lot and what you can do out of it as far as play action goes is really light people up with down the field passing. That's what I saw with the play action is you see some of these plays and we'll get into these plays and where they come in, but you see them, the guys are like wide open. Yeah. The receivers. So like when they do the play action, like everybody goes for the run. They're like, Oh shit, they're running. And these receivers are just like, no, no, I'm right here. Wide open. It's just like, (laughs) they don't necessarily, these quarterbacks don't necessarily have to be the best passers. No, they just have to be the, the right kind of quarterback. Yeah. You have to be the guy to pilot the ship. Yeah. And the orchestrator of this whole offense is a guy named Paul Johnson, who later won national championships at Georgia Southern using the same type of uh, strategy. Yeah. He was a coach at Georgia Tech, won an ACC title. And um, it was good that they had this offense 
because they had a former quarterback who ran something similar, who's now the head coach at Navy, Ken Niamatololo. He was like kind of the quarterback coach and uh, offensive assistant to Johnson, who followed Johnson when he coached at Navy. I was going to say he was his assistant coach, and then and then took over, and he's the head coach at Navy now. Yeah. I, I think he's the only Polynesian uh, head coach. Uh, BYU's coach now is. Oh, he he's, is. He's been there. He's been there for about like five years or okay. so, six years. But okay. Yeah. They. Um, but what this uh, what this offense was able to do, and I think is very important, is it allows teams with smaller personnel to compete because it's based on discipline and reads and things like that. That if you look at their receivers, their um, what do you call slot backs? Yeah, they're like five eight. You know yeah, what I mean? They're not they're, big guys. They're not big guys. They're extremely fast, and e- like you said, it works into their system. Yeah, basically, what you need for this offense to work is two speedy slot backs who are basically like wide receiver running back hybrids, and an enormous bruising fullback to take the pounding because you're getting quick hitters up the middle. Even when you're not getting the ball, you're gonna get blasted. Yeah, you're gonna have to put that block on that huge ass guy. That was something that they said was in this formation when I kept reading it was like. The fullback has to be huge. Yeah, and, and that, he has it, to be able to take a freaking pounding. Yep. And luckily for them, heading into 1992, a senior finally gets to show his stuff and proves to be the perfect uh, ingredient in that offense. But uh, like, like I said before, you want to get you want to get into the season and kind of what transpires. Yeah, let's let's start off with the season because they. Like you said, I think they were ranked preseason eight or ninth in the WAC, which yeah. is which is. Terrible. Awful. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they're pretty much looked at, they're going to lose pretty much almost all their conference games. Yeah. I mean, they're not going to compete with the BYUs or the, um, who was good that year, the, even the Fresno State, because that was Fresno State's first year out of the Big West, now in the whack. So, um, so they go out and they beat Oregon. And Oregon wasn't a huge college football powerhouse like they were in the early 2000s. No, they? Th- but. Most of that team went on to win the Pac-10 and go to the Rose Bowl two years later. So it was a great team. And I think a lot of the reason why what people overlook in this um, in this schedule, why they pick them so low, UH doesn't play a lot of road games. Oh, yeah. And when this schedule comes out, you learn that they're playing three of their first four games on the road. And... If you've never taken that flight before, particularly going east, it is especially because where they're traveling, Eugene, not too bad. You're on the West Coast. Then you got to go to Colorado Springs, and then you got to go to Salt Lake City. Yeah, it's brutal. It's it's eight hours to to mainland or whatever, or ten hours, or I forget how long it's, the it's flight six is to California. Okay, so. it's six to California. Yeah. Okay, yeah, but it's brutal, man. It's not an easy. You know, little flight, which is why they don't play so many away games. And also, I I imagine teams want to go to Hawaii, but yeah, yeah, no, and they play the extra game there because of all the travel for the rest of the teams. They get the extra day, but um, makes sense. They go to Oregon and they win uh, uh, twenty four to uh, twenty one. I mean, they go out and beat a Pac twelve team or Pac ten team at the time that went to a bowl game. But uh, Carter isn't the primary quarterback. Oddly enough, I thought this was interesting. Hey, everybody. Just want to take a quick break to uh, let you know that our Sports Experience podcast is brought to you by Engel Studio here, and uh, they're here in Tucson for all your recording needs. He had to split and sit behind. I mean, obviously, they share duties because with a lack of slot backs, Carter and Ivan Jasper, who is now offensive coordinator for Niamatololo at Navy, yep. another weird spider-off type I, deal. You know I love it. Oh, he, he he's playing quarterback, and they're alternating at slot back. So it's them, um, Eddie Kialoha, and then you have Derek Branch and uh, Brian Gordon playing receiver. They okay. re- really, don't use a, really don't use a tight end. But in this game, you know, Jasper plays very, very well. And they also get, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a shit ton of productivity from their fullback, who yes. is a guy named Travis Sims. And they realize that the running game is going to work. It is, yeah, because they're gashing them left and right. Not much for passing, but Sims has a pretty darn good year this year. But it op- like I'm saying, it opens up the passing game. So these guys, Ivan and and uh, what's the other guy's name? I want you to Michael say. Michael Carter. Um, they Oh, uh, okay. 
I forgot what the guy passing is. game. It, well, the 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 sorry, never mind. I'm getting off on a thing, but it opens up the passing game to where these guys don't have to be the best passers, and they can take it off a run. And it, it like I was really impressed with this formation and the the ability to confuse defenses. Yeah. And, like you were saying, when the run game, the first game, when the when the fullback has all that productivity, you can almost look down and be like, oh, we're going to be a good team. Yeah, I mean, in that game, I mean, they ran for over 300 yards. Sims had 132, Jasper with 91, and Carter with 89. I mean, your primary guys are eating. Yes. And it's pretty terrific. And that's what them. you want. And then they go to uh, Air Force. Yeah, this is an interesting game. Yeah, it was a weird one. Uh, Jasper and Carter end up having ankle injuries. Yeah, and both go out. Both go out. So they're down to their third string quarterback, a guy named Rodney Glover. And uh, for those of you who don't know, this is uh, actually Danny Glover's nephew. I shit you not. Like the, I'm getting too old for this shit, Danny <laughs> Glover from Lethal Weapon. Yeah. Like, but he comes in and the defense, for whatever reason, just brought it today. Because in that old WAC conference, it was just a high scoring affair after high scoring affair. And Luckily for them, they have a kicker and punter, yep. same person. You don't really see that anymore, who uh, went on to have a decent NFL career. I mean, just a few Pro Bowls, a couple Super Bowls, longest field goal ever made probably for, oh, I don't know, 20 years. years. Yeah. 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 Um, a guy uh, named Jason Elam. Yeah. And even though they I have... Guess a productive career. He had a, he had a productive career. Yes. I, <laughs> I guess. I guess. But they won six to three. Yeah. In kind of a weird, ugly game. And it's funny, what I take most away from this, I saw an interview, they had asked Elam after the game, hey, how did you like, because he had a 78-yard punt Oh yeah. in this game. They're like, how did you like playing here in Colorado Springs? And he's like, I love the altitude. If I could play here all the time, I would. And then a few months later, he's drafted by the Broncos and gets to play in Denver for his whole career. Yeah, or, well, until he played for Atlanta at the end. But he played, God, he probably probably played like, 12 seasons in Denver. It's got to be a pretty awesome feeling when you know how far you can kick it and you do it in that, in that high altitude. And you're oh, just man. like, is the ball going to come down? <laughs> like it, it, it's probably awesome, you know? Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. So they're two and zero, and they're like really Ooh. surprising the hell out of people. And now we get into the game that game I watched. I game. watched the, the, I feel like I watched highlights for like the first three quarters and I watched the whole fourth quarter of this game. It was, Fucking awesome. I love these old ass games on yeah. YouTube. I can't get enough of ju even just the highlights. You're just like, oh, that was awesome. Well, it's the rivalry game. Yep. BYU gets BYU comes to town. BYU is the conference favorite. And it was a very, very seesaw game. Yeah. Just back and forth, like completely That's momentum. And it's not like just a little bit. Momentum just drastically shifted throughout the game. For yeah, this. well, when these 30-year-old uh, men come into town, you know, it's a weird football game from time to time, you know? <laughs> they can rent their own cars. They can get their own, you know, loans. I don't know. But yeah, right. BYU is just a bunch of old men. They can have all their wives. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but in the fourth quarter, they, uh, Hawaii fumbles. BYU recovers. And the, the guys are talking. They're just like, man, this is BYU's game. They need yeah. to hold the ball. All they need to do is, like, run down the clock. Because I think they were up four. They were up three, something like that. Yeah, so it, what ended up happening was is um, – Hawaii goes up 29 to 10 in the yeah. third quarter. They get a great interception return from Brian Addison. Matt Harding, who played receiver and return kicks, who's like their Rudy, blocked the punt. And Jasper scored on that one. But um, what ends up happening is BYU ends up taking the lead, like you said, by three. By three, okay. 29. And uh, Jamal Willis, BYU's running back, fumbles the ball trying to ice the game. Yeah. It's just a bad quarterback running back exchange. I was gonna say they they are not on the same page. You can see that the it's just a horrible handoff, horrible it, pitch, whatever you want to call it. It's almost like fate intervenes. Yeah, almost. yeah. it's like snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. I and like it. Hawaii takes over, and mind you, this is at a time when college football you don't play for overtime. You play for the win. Yeah. I mean, playing for a tie is not a good feeling in anything. But they take over deep in their own territory, and Jasper on what is one of probably the probably the best throw of his career. I oh mean, yeah, him 
Carter and Glover all averaged under like 44% passing that year. I mean, not very accurate, but he uncorks a 57 yarder to Harding to put him right in scoring position. I was going to say, it puts him like in the 20. And, yeah. And it's such a great, you could see the reaction of all the Hawaii players after that catch because oh, they're yeah. almost acting like it was a touchdown. They were just like, woo! It's like we're back in the game, but you still have to make plays. And Derek Branch comes up huge on a third down to keep the sticks moving. Oh, yeah. And put him at first and goal yep and branch is actually probably one of the only players probably him and sims to have been on that 89 team oh interesting so he's like a senior yeah so branch might have been the sims really didn't play yet to sit behind like jamal farmer and guys like that but branch actually played on that team like yeah. even as a freshman so. yeah he, he makes a great catch and then a couple extra yards to get that first down exactly. it's, it's a great yeah it's you're right it's great and then this is what i'm alluding to so much it was this touchdown they do a play action mm -hmm. and literally and who's the receiver in the uh, marlo lewis he is so wide open. yeah there's nobody near him no like, not even in the shot so like they have the camera angle and like nobody's even near him in the shot <laughs> like it's that's how open he is and he like literally just like catches it it's just like yes i love it it's <laughs> it's such a great because i love hawaii in this rivalry yeah, if that makes sense. You know what I well, mean? They're like, the little guy because yeah. for so long that had to I can't imagine what it was like, like growing up there and knowing BYU is coming to town. Not only have they entrenched themselves on this island, but now they're coming to kick the crap out of you in football. But exactly. If you think about it, 89, 90 and 92, that senior class only lost to BYU once once. Yeah. And that had to feel pretty damn special. Oh, that had to be so awesome. But uh, yeah, they're three and zero. They're they're a complete like mystery of a team because you're trying to figure out didn't we pick these guys last? Yeah, like, last with a whack. Yeah, so it's like yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not like you're in the SEC or anything. But. And then they uh, they run into a Utah team who's pretty good. So Utah's had teams who are okay. Yeah, no. It, this is what I this is kind of what I alluded to before. That travel's got to get you because yeah. you go to Eugene. Then you go to Colorado Springs. Then you have to go back to Hawaii, and then you have to go out to Salt Lake City. So, I mean, I don't know if it's the jet lag. Utah had a good team, though. I mean, uh, former Falcon running back Jamal Anderson was on that team. Yeah. He scored in this game. Uh, they had talent, and uh, they took it to him, yeah, honestly. They, yeah, what was it, like 24-17 or something like that? 38-17. Uh, oh, okay, 38-17. Um, they drew within as close as 21-17, to 17, okay. but – it just kind of got away from them, and Utah got 17 points off of turnovers in that yep. game. I mean, and, and I feel like turnovers for this is a show of fatigue, and like you were saying, not being and maybe. the offense in general. You have to be so disciplined because of all the exchanges, the quarterbacks not being super accurate. You know, you're if things aren't going your way, you're kind of screwed. Yeah. Like, well, yeah. that's the thing about this formation is they say if everybody's not on the same page, it's almost the, the heaviest turnover ratio, yeah. if that makes sense. So no, like, I totally understand. It's, yeah. it's such a great formation. If everybody's doing it, if they're not, you're really heavy on those turnovers. Yep. And that killed him in that game. Yeah. But, uh, so everyone thinks they're kind of like, Oh, okay. They had a nice little run, yeah. you know, pull off a couple miracle wins, whatever. And then they get the pleasure of playing one of my least favorite schools, in addition to BYU, Fresno State, at home in one of the craziest seesaw. Games. Like, these, if for those of you who don't know, because you know, I grew up in San Diego, so I saw this whole conference during this time period. Every game it seems to be like in the forties. That's why that Air Force game makes absolutely no sense to me. Yeah. Like, outside of the both quarterbacks going out, but Air Force should have put up some points. Right? Yeah. You know what I, so yeah, that game was really interesting. Because Hawaii's defense, um, while they were they were more of a uh, pursuit defense. Okay. Not a lot of big dudes. Ma'atanavasa had a great career with the Broncos later on, but it's a lot of stunting, it's a lot of um you know, actively pursuing the ball carrier and gang tackling a lot of speed, you know, because you have three down linemen, then you have three linebackers, one of which kind of lines up on the line of scrimmage, though, too. And then you have a free safety kind of linebacker rover position in addition to your two safeties your two. and cornerbacks. And uh, just built more on speed and, uh, you know, stick and move type of thing than just like mauling you. Which at that time in that conference, 
you had to have it. It was almost the precursor to when uh, Gary Patterson started inventing the four two five to stop passing teams specifically in this conference like BYU and San Diego State and everything like that. Oh, so, that's really interesting. Yeah, just that's strategy aside. I yeah. just thought I'd bring no, it up. No, I like that. You know, I love that shit. The, the strategy behind it, it, I find so really fascinating, but they're more what you're what I took from that is they're more of like a team scheme as opposed to like individual athleticism. Athleticism is going to overpower it, if that makes sense. Yeah, and it's evident in a couple of the games where they could be overmatched, but it's also evident because they have the team speed. They can take care of business against lumbering teams yeah. with just good discipline and uh, the ability to really actively pursue ball carriers and get after the quarterback. Yeah, that's awesome. But uh, back to the Fresno game. This yeah, the Fresno. Back and forth. I mean, first quarter, Fresno's winning 23-8. to eight. And this is a team with future Super Bowl winning quarterback Trent Dilfer, Lorenzo Neal, probably the best fullback of the 2000s, and uh, Ron Rivers, who replaced uh, Barry Sanders in Detroit. Yeah. For that Bobby Lane curse, I guess. That's interesting. But, uh, but they the, beat Fresno. Uh-huh. They, they come back. And a lot of these games seem like they were a seesaw. Am I crazy about that? So no, like, that was just the era of football yeah. that, that was played. I mean, they're down twenty three to eight, and then they're up. Um, then they're only then it's thirty to twenty seven at the half. So, you know, for and then they score fourteen points in the third quarter. Yeah, and then it's forty four to thirty, but Fresno doesn't stop. Like, and that's I've talked to my dad about this. Every game we went to, it seemed like this would happen. Like, no matter who played each other, if they were any good. Like, we saw Marshall Falk's freshman season, and we'll get to the game later because I was actually at it that UH played. They had a 51-51 to tie against BYU. That's wild. For the WAC title. Yeah, it was absolutely insane. Teams wouldn't, lay, like, roll over, essentially. Like, they always thought they were in it. Well, yeah, because you got bullets in the gun, and the defenses aren't dominant. Yeah, they're not dominant. And... No offense to them, but the offenses in that conference at that time were really, really good. They had really good players on their teams. Well, it's interesting when they, I feel like that whole conference scouted offense and they were like, you know what? We're going to, our defense throughout the conference is just going to be a little bit less. Yeah. And, you know, even in this game, they're getting touchdowns from special teams. Harding took a kickback 97 yards for oh, yeah. a touchdown to really get after it. And it's, crazy they had 347 rushing yards in that game Damn. and over almost 34 minutes taking time of possession which is good because they, all they end up winning 47 to 45 dilfer's the zombie they can't kill yes. like they can't put them away until the clock expires that's basically what gave them the victory and also this is an important win because by beating Fresno State and BYU, you have the tiebreaker over both of them to win a conference title, which Hawaii had not yet won since 1979. Yeah. So it's a big, it's important a huge win. win. And, and it's the, a huge win, too, coming off of that Utah loss, because everybody's saying that they're yeah. not a good team, and Fresno is a good team, so coming out and showing, like, hey, we're still a great team. Fresno beat USC in the Freedom Bowl that year. I mean, they're good team. Yeah. Really good team. Um, next week is homecoming against uh, UNLV, who's still in the Big West. So they're, what, 4-1? and one, And they lay the wood yes. to the running Rebs. I mean, it's they use their fourth-string quarterback in this game. Yeah, I thought Just, that was weird. Well, they use him because they take all their starters out. Okay. So it's like, hey, it's homecoming, you know. Go in there. Go, go in there and play. Yeah. I mean, Jasper had two TD passes to... Brandon Harding. I mean, even Glover had a, an 80-yard touchdown pass. Yeah, it seemed like they game. were playing everybody in that one. Yeah, you get everybody in the game. You, yeah. you, if you when you start the game 31 to nothing, why just, not? Yeah, yeah, put everybody in. Put everybody in. Um, and they continue to just to uh, beating teams. So they go on to beat uh, UTEP mm -hmm. and on the road, which is pretty impressive. Yes, because you know it's still El Paso, and uh, yeah. Uh, Gordon scoring a touchdown, Carter, Branch. I mean, the defense really comes to play. Got uh, three sacks. Um, 
Yeah, Sims is just absolutely a monster toad in the rock. Him and Kealoha. And uh, even Sims' backup, uh, Calvin Melvin, scores a touchdown. So they take care of him 41 to 21. But it was 24 to 24 to lead out the gate. And that's yeah. kind of what you notice with this team when you look at these um, games is they are straight up jumping on people. Well, after this Utah victory, or excuse me, after this Utah defeat and the close game with Fresno, these two next games, they like – they pretty much are like putting the game away first half. Yeah. You know, they're like, hey, hey, you guys could try and come back, but that's not going to, it's not going to work. And and that's kind of the thing that helps their defense, you know, too, is when you get staked to a lead, you can play more aggressively. You know, your guys along the front, like Tanavasa and Junior Tagawai and uh, what's his name? Tasi Fumui. They can all get up the field. Your linebackers, you know, that when they can get, um, you know, really start attacking the ball, guys like, uh, uh, Stuart Williams and uh, uh, what's his what's his name? Oh God, I can't even. Re- oh, uh, Robert Blakeney. They can come and go after the guys and like go after the opposing players. And then your cornerbacks, your defensive backs, like Brian Addison, he was their leading tackler that year. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, he's their free safety. And then you had uh, uh, Demetrius Henderson and Zach Odom, whose older brother even played at Hawaii. Those cornerbacks were racking up turnovers because when you're up twenty-four to zero, you put these already pass happy teams in almost pass happy mode. Yeah. And, and they can, these cornerbacks can be that much more aggressive. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. That's and awesome. The defense can do it too. Yeah. And uh, play Colorado State at home oh, yeah, the next Colorado. week. Uh, Colorado, this is pre Colorado State being actually really good in the 90s. Yeah. 94 is when they really turn it on. And, you know, you're up 21 to zero at the gate in this game. Like, again. Yeah. That, that's what I find so impressive is that it almost all plays into this offense is that you're up by three scores. You're a running team. You can just sit on the ball and, and control let, the clock and let your defense just absolutely kick the crap out of people. Like, that's what I found really awesome is that entering the fourth quarter was already 24 to zero. The overall game strategy, I feel like coming from the, the coaching staff was was great. You know, the the fact that they were going to go up early and then control the ball. Like, you, it's hard to come back t- from that. Yeah, and you get three picks from uh, Odom, Addison, and Henderson. I mean, you're just sitting on it, and you're, you're just rolling through the whack schedule because it's honestly about to end. All they have left are two games left. Well, let's get into this next game because oh, I feel game. like this is the Dom Detola game. This, this is, is this is the Dom Detola Sophie's Choice game, actually. Yeah, this is the uh, when his heart... You know, it goes against his mind. <laughs> well, my my dad, for those of you who don't know, um, used to teach at San Diego State um, uh, Aeronautical Engineering, and he would get tickets to the SDSU games. Yeah. So he's like, well, my son likes football. I guess I can take him, you know, and they were always fun. All these games are amazing. And uh, entering this game, it's weird because although San Diego State, I remember this season vividly because Marshall Falk got robbed of a Heisman. They had a tie opening weekend against USC. Didn't you, I'm sorry, didn't you text me that when we yeah. were talking about this? You're like, and Marshall Falk got that. And I could like hear you getting angry. Oh, man, dude. That 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 game where he they tied USC, um, they had a really hard non-conference schedule, though. They had played UCLA, too, and they played a lot of road games to start the year. But what they are is very good in the whack. Yeah. They play like a Thursday night game in Provo and beat BYU. So entering this game, even though they're like a 500 team, all of their wins have come in the whack. And if they beat Hawaii and they beat Fresno State the following week, they'll get to win the conference and go to the Holiday Bowl with like a 6-4-1 and one record. Yeah, they'll be whack champions. Yeah, and to be quite honest, it stinks for Hawaii, but you got to go out and win this game. And I'll never forget, my dad took me to this game and we sat basically in the Hawaii section and... Even when they're not good, their fans travel well, and they're generally pretty cool people. So it was kind of enjoyable to see that. And Hawaii is ranked, I think, this week, finally. I was going to say they finally get ranked, and they were kind of talking shit on this where they felt like they should have been ranked before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I believe they're seven. Yeah, they're seven and one. Yeah. So they're straight up rolling. And, um, well, let's just say uh, – well, Marshall Falk pushes her shit in is what happens. Yeah. And I, I can vividly remember this. He had over 300 yards rushing in this game. That was the only thing, like, you know, when you go and look at 
highlights or stats from a game. That was pretty much the only thing that really stood out. It was just like, yeah, Falk took over this game. And Hawaii's defense could do nothing. But yeah. then again, this guy's an NFL Hall of Famer. I mean, the best player on the field. He scored four touchdowns. My boy Darnay Scott, who sh- should have had a better pro career if he wasn't drafted by Cincinnati, he had a long touchdown. I mean, David Lowry went off at court. He had three intercept. I believe he had um, two or three interceptions in that game. Hawaii didn't even turn it over. It, but it didn't matter. Yeah, it didn't matter. It, it didn't matter in the grand scheme because he had 28 toting the rock. And, uh, yeah, they get the crap beat out of him in yeah. this one. And it's it sucks for Hawaii because they have to wait. They – Obviously, they have to beat Wyoming because you have to just keep winning games. But by winning this game, San Diego State's in the driver's seat if they beat Fresno State the following week. Yeah, it's it's their uh, title. It's it's San Diego State's title to lose at this point, and that's what Hawaii wanted. They wanted they wanted fate to be in their hands. Yeah, exactly. But they have to wait. Luckily, they get to go home and uh, play Wyoming, and that's kind of a rivalry game as well. Um, against them, Wyoming isn't as good as they were, uh, as they'll soon to become okay. in the uh, mid '90s. But uh, they beat them. No, they beat them pretty good. <laughs> yeah. They, you know, I mean, uh, coming off of that San Diego loss, I feel like they were ready for this game. You know how teams are just like, no, no, we're going to beat the shit out of whoever comes up in front of us. And the special teams really came up big in this game because not only did Harding have the block punt for a touchdown, Branch had a kickoff return. Right after halftime. I mean, and at that point, the route is on because the following drive, Sims gets another touchdown. And uh, they win this game with Carter throwing three picks. So that's pretty good. I just got to say, you know. Yeah, and Tanavasa was everywhere, six tackles and a tackle for loss. There, You could see their offense definitely turns the ball over, though. I'll say that. Oh, very much so. Is But – you know, that's the flex bone. Yeah, you know, some days you have it, some days you don't. But yeah. they are whack champions for the so this, first time. This lets this um, has them be whack champions because San Diego actually loses to Fresno. Yeah, yeah, and that was a that was a difficult one for me to watch. I remember that was a well. I bet it's the cognitive dissonance. You know, the Hawaii winning but San Diego losing. The uh... fuck Trent Dilfer. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no. Ah, shit. Dom's breaking stuff. No, no, uh, no. <laughs> But uh, but oddly enough, because they have 12 games, I don't know why they designed the schedule this way. Um, they have three more games, or no, pardon me. They have two more two games more. left to play um, at this point in the season. Yeah, because they go and beat Tulsa. At home, yeah. And they, uh, I think they beat uh, Pitt at home too, right? Yeah, the Tulsa game is pretty interesting. They were down 3-0, to zero, mm-hmm. so they didn't jump on them. And then they run off 38 straight points. Yeah. And, you know, just... They're taking guys out. Carter had three TD runs. Uh, Kealoa had uh, one as well. And, uh, yeah, he was the big guy in that game. Him and uh, Sims had over 100 yards, but Kealoa had almost a 96 total uh, rushing and receiving. But, uh, yeah, it sets up the pit game. I, I don't know if you've ever seen that one, but uh, Curtis Martin's on that team. Okay. And Pitt played them very well despite not having a lot of talent around him. Well, that was my – here's my question was, uh, I know Pitt uh, goes through years that they have good teams. Were they not a great team this year? No, they were – Pitt was dog shit from about the time Marino left until yeah. kind of towards the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, they had good players. They just didn't have, like, good great teams. teams. yeah. But, I mean, in this game, they were up um, – 23 to 14 yeah um at the end of the third quarter i mean basically their entire offensive strategy was just keep feeding future hall of famer curtis martin against this smaller defense but uh there were some really great plays uh kealoa had a terrific uh touchdown run uh to get them back into the game and then harding had a td catch to just put them ahead for good uh towards the end and uh it like i said Martin had almost 40 carries in this game. Um, Walter Santiago, who was their rover, had 13 tackles. Tanavasa had 12. Tagawai had 11. And, yeah, he, yeah it, it was just 
stop Curtis Martin and hope your offense scores. <laughs> and a great game, I bet, to end their regular season because it was a hard-fought battle. It, it must feel so much better. So when Aloha Stadium gets rocking, especially when the team is like good, I don't know if it's like this anymore. It was a little bit like this when I was there. Um, you can see on the field just debris, like yeah. toilet paper, you know, ripped up programs, every confetti. Everyone just throws shit on the field. And this is when they were playing on the old uh, AstroTurf too, which, you know, dangerous. But I love that look on that on that field and that rusty old stadium. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, it was interesting. I watched the BYU game and the uh, the fans were so loud that it was, you could see it was hard for them on the field. And that's when you know a stadium is rocking. Yeah. Is when the the atmosphere is just through the roof. Yeah, like when they're good, I have I was lucky enough to go when they are having a really good run. Um, it, it, the stadium shakes. Yeah. I mean, it's not like a well- Constructed. Built structure <laughs> is, is the nicest way of putting it. But when they sell that place out and when people, because you don't know why, you have plenty of other shit to do. Yeah. You know, you don't have to go to a football game, especially if the team's trash. But, and they're good and they fill the thing out. Oh, man, that's a big home field advantage. Oh, definitely. But like we said, already WAC champions. So at this time, when you're WAC champions, guess what you get to do? You get to go to the Holiday Bowl. At Jack Murphy Stadium in at, San Diego. At the time, and this is why I think bowl games, it almost takes away from their legitimacy. Mm-hmm. Was I watched it, they were like, it's the uh, rental car thrifty car thrifty, rental yeah, holiday it's just bowl like, come yeah come on can we just please call it the holiday bowl and they, keep it like that they had a commercial for the uh oh god what was it the poolon weed eater independence bowl yeah exactly like, it's just like and the it, they would always be so stupid here in tucson you know what i yeah. mean like the uh tostito scoop em bowl it's the, like not even the uh, actual chip what but was the, the one i used to go for christmas here Oh, the Wiser Lock Copper Bowl. Yep, that's exactly what it was. <laughs> Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. No, but uh, so here's my question about this: they they play an Illinois team that ha- doesn't have a great record. It's six four and one. Basically, w- w- the way it worked out, the old Holiday Bowl rules were, is that the top whack team plays like maybe the third or fourth best Big Ten team. Okay. And Illinois' record wasn't, like, good on paper, but they had, like, a hard non-conference schedule. Okay, okay. So, like I said, with San Diego State, San Diego State finished 5-5-1. Five, five, and one. All of their wins were in conference. Yeah. They just lost and tied everybody that they didn't play. Like, SC, UCLA, that, I think that was the year, yeah. They played Miami at the end of the regular season, and that was the game. The Rock went into the stands after Monty Montezuma, the mascot. Yeah. Because he was trolling him. <laughs> so, which I'm always proud to say I was there at that seminal moment. That's awesome. I don't know if I was in the, the can or anything, but I do remember that game because they played them like three times when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. And every game there was a fight. Every single one. And got a little out of hand. No, I bet. I bet. But so Illinois is a better team than their than their record shows. Yes, they are. They um, offensively they're pretty vanilla and bland because Jeff George has been gone for a few years. Um, don't really have a, much of a running game. Really, their best player on offense is Brad Hopkins, who played like a decade and a half for the Oilers slash Titans. He was a Pro Bowl player. He was really good. Um, defensively, though, they have a lot of good linebackers. Um, okay, Lou Tepper's their coach. He was defensive coordinator for a while, so they have. I think Dana Howard won the Butkus Award. Kevin Hardy's there and uh, a freshman, and he showed up in this game a lot. Um, ended up becoming a borderline Hall of Famer. Simeon Rice is oh, okay. in, at Illinois. I mean, other than that, I think uh, John Holosek is playing linebacker for him too. So that's really the strength of their team. Um, and, you know, Hawaii, though, has their flex bone – and despite some really good plays by Hardy and Howard and Rice, they have just so much more team speed than Illinois in this game. And uh, what I always question about watching it is I don't know who was calling plays for Illinois, but their size advantage was quite Noticeable. vast. Yeah. Why they didn't just try and ground and pound them in the beginning to keep Hawaii's offense off the field, even if you're getting threes, you know, Jasper and Carter can't score. Sims, who had almost 1,500 yards rushing in the regular season, 
he can't score if he doesn't get the ball. If he's not putting on a helmet or anything like that. Yeah. It's but, interesting. The overall, like you're saying, the overall game strategy might just not have been there. And what Illinois should have done was more of a control the ball, control the <laughs> clock, actually. And that's what I found weird is they go up 7-0 to zero in the first quarter, and you're thinking, like, man, can the defense just get a stop here yeah. and there? And to their credit, Sims ties it up with a night. Nice, it was a great play from their offensive line. Their offensive line has a lot of bigger guys on it as opposed to their defense to uh, really kind of help with the running game as far as, um, you know, Doug, Vi- uh, Doug Violetti, um, Peter Pauley, uh, uh Lene Omosa, you know, guys like that up front really open in the holes and, uh, and letting combo this blocking. running this running scheme work. Yeah, and it works to perfection. And what I think the turning point in the entire game is, though, is on the following drive in the second quarter, um, Illinois drives all the way down to the one-yard line. And Tagawai makes a great play from the backside on an option play, and they have to settle for a field goal. Oh, okay. And I don't know if that's when all the air went out of the balloon, but when you're kicking a 19-yard field goal and you're keeping an offense like Hawaii's in the game, it's bad news. Yeah. It's bad news. Because that's when they really turn it around, and we see them kind of take over the game at this point. Yeah. Sims scores a touchdown, make it 14-10. to 10. Elam has two field goals, so it's 20-10 to 10 yep. in, in the fourth quarter, and you know kind of they're wearing them down. They're kind of chipping away. The writing's on the wall. You can see one team is going up and the other team is going down, if you will. Yeah, they're, I like in the game they're talking about Sims, uh, talking about his calves, how they're like the biggest you've ever seen. You yep. know, saying, uh, I, haven't worn pa- I haven't worn pants since the 11th grade. Yeah. <laughs> like, I haven't worn jeans. Yeah, they called him Barney Rubble. If you look at him, it's actually pretty yeah, he, accurate. He's, yes. But uh, yeah, fourth quarter, they really put the game away. It's probably the most iconic play from the game is uh, – Carter, tough as nails, absolutely tough as nails. He get, he takes a shot on this pass, and he throws like a duck downfield on a play-action pass. Yep. But Derek Branch isn't necessarily wide open. I mean, he's covered passes, you know, wounded duck to an extent, and he just jumps up and grabs it and takes off. Yeah. 53-yard touchdown. It's 27 to 10, and, you know, you can feel it. They've it's still to this date, even though Illinois scores another touchdown at the end to make it 27 mm-hmm. 17, it is to date their only mainland bowl win. The rest of their bowl wins have all come in their home stadium, oddly enough. That's actually pretty interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. And they, this is, was this their first bowl victory? Yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, first WAC champions, first bowl victory, mm-hmm. only bowl victory outside of Hawaii. Yeah, it's still to this day. Yeah. They've only played in two outside They've, of Hawaii. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. But uh yeah, it was uh caps off an eleven and two season for head coach Bob Wagner and yep. his awesome staff. Twentieth in the AP, nineteen in the coaches. And they've still never matched that since then. And some people were saying that they were ranked a little low. They were. Um if you if you look at it, they probably could have been ten, twelve, you know, whatever. Well, I mean you think about it. You lose in Salt Lake, and then you lose to Marshall Falk, who's damn near, in my opinion, a top five running back who ever played in yeah. the NFL. You could have been thirteen or no, but eleven and two is nothing to sneeze at. No, and it's they're, great. They're, they were inducted into the UH Hall of Fame a couple of years ago. I'm that sure. team is so revered because nobody expected it outside of the guys in that locker room. Yeah, and I think that's what made it special for that team and that university because the uh how do i put this the aftermath was not so good for this program no yeah we we i mean that's another story but i I thought it was interesting i think it was after they beat wyoming and were whack champions one of the guys was just like don't jump on the bandwagon now we don't want you on it now it was so great he's just like we don't care if you didn't (laughs) think we were going to be good we knew we were going to be good and that's why i loved this it's almost like the bad news bears except they win at the end yeah they win at the end exactly which uh still impressive i mean uh i'll always love this team um you know well the university everything about the program what it is now uh it's just kind of uh I'm glad we got to talk about this because 
it's one of the most overlooked teams in college football history, utilizing a strategy that's completely, you, I think maybe three or four programs run it. I, no, I take that back. Probably six to seven. And three of them are the military academies. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, I was going to say, yeah, they Ronald all Lolo's coaching there with Jasper right now. Yeah. They but, all came under, uh, Paul Johnson. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And they have, um, oh, I was going to, they have to run it because of the size disadvantage. Yeah. And who better to run a disciplined offense than officers in our nation's military. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that was the 1992 Hawaii Rainbow Warriors. Thank you for listening. Hey, everybody. This is just a stock message at the end of every episode. We hope you enjoyed whatever athlete and or team that that episode was about. Just want to say give us a quick follow on all social media. We have a YouTube channel, the Sports Experience Podcast. And we're on Instagram, Totolo Dominic and myself, C. Quinn Comedy. So give us a follow all around. Um, we're always recording right here at Angle Studio. Thank you all very much.